Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. Let's get started and look into our daily quiz. Before we start with our practice questions for the day, a quick gentle reminder. Baiju's Exam Prep IAS has already been on Telegram. If you have not yet joined the channel, please do join so that you get all the current affairs related updates. Let's get started and look into the first question. Consider the following statement. When a state gives a general consent to the CBI for probing a case, the agency is not required to seek fresh permission every time it enters that state in connection with investigation or for every case. Withdrawal of consent, if any, by a state government can be affected prospectively and not retrospectively. Which of the statements given above is are incorrect? The question is asking for the incorrect statement. The answer to this is none. Why? That is because both the statements are correct. Why have we taken this practice question? Because this article on the Indian Express says Telangana withdraws general consent to CBI. Let us try and understand what are these statements. When you look into the first statement, it makes a mention of general consent. What is this general consent? Let's take the example of Telangana. Telangana earlier had given the general consent. This means the Central Bureau of Investigation would be able to enter the state of Telangana, investigate all types of cases without the permission of the state government of Telangana every single time. So the general consent is given for a specific period of time, let's say one year, two year, five years, so on and so forth. For this period, how many ever cases come to the Central Bureau of Investigation, they would be able to investigate without the permission of the state government. So general consent means CBI goes to that particular state and investigates all types of cases. Then we have something called as a specific consent. The specific consent is where that state government would be giving permission only for that case. So it is not for all cases for a specific period of time, but instead it is for a restricted case, which is what is called as the specific consent. The first statement reads, when a state gives a general consent to CBI for probing a case, the agency is not required to seek fresh permission. Yes, the statement is right. When you look into the second statement, withdrawal of consent, if any, by a state government can be affected prospectively and not retrospectively. In the specific case, we have Telangana which has withdrawn the general consent. This basically means if the CBI is already investigating one of the cases, let's say for example it is to do with bribery or let's say it is to do with corruption, it is already investigating a case. Can this case be withdrawn from Central Bureau of Investigation? No. It can only happen prospectively. So if there is a case which comes in the near future that can be stopped but for those cases which are already being investigated that is in a retrospective effect that cannot be withdrawn so the second statement is also right which is withdrawal of consent if any by a state government can be affected prospectively that is in the near future and not retrospectively that which has been given consent already such cases will be continued to be investigated by the Central Bureau of Investigation. We have the Supreme Court of India in Kazi Lentop Dorji versus the Central Bureau of Investigation has clarified this stand as well. Now let's look into the next practice question. With respect to C-295 aircraft, which of the following statements is are correct? The C-295 was originally produced by a French aircraft manufacturer named Constructinus Aeronauticus SA. The C-295 MW is a transport aircraft with 5 to 10 capacity and a maximum speed of 480 km per hour. Which of the statements are correct? The answer to this is two only. Why have we taken this practice question? Because of the reference in the Indian Express article. When you look into the first statement, the first statement is wrong. That is because Airbus C-295 is a medium tactical transport aircraft that was originally produced by the Spanish aircraft manufacturer. It is not French manufacturer, but it is Spanish aircraft manufacturer, which is why the first statement is wrong. When you look into the second statement, yes, C-295 MW is a transport aircraft 
with 5 to 10 ton capacity and a maximum speed of 480 km per hour as given in the Indian Express. So we have the Prime Minister of India who recently laid the foundation stone of a Tata Airbus plant in Vadodara. So where was this plant inaugurated? It was in Vadodara. This can also be very important from the preliminary examination point of view. This project happens to be the first of its kind where a private company from India will manufacture military aircraft in India. So Tata is associated with it. It happens to be a private company. So for the first time what we will have is a private company which will be manufacturing military aircrafts in India in tie up with another company. The manufacturing will also cater to export orders for the transport aircraft as well. What are the applications of this aircraft? As a tactical transport, the C-295 can carry troops and logistic supplies from main airfields to forward operating airfields and is capable of short takeoff and landing on unprepared airstrips. It can operate from airstrips that are just 2200 feet long and can carry tactical missions at low speeds of 110 knots. The aircraft can additionally be used for casualty or medical evacuation, disaster response, special missions and maritime protocols as well. So remember, these are some of the applications of this aircraft and that is why India is allowing for the manufacture of these aircrafts. Now let's look into the next practice question. Which of the following provisions were amended by the First Amendment Act of 1951? Empowered the state to make special provisions for the advancement of socially and economically backward classes. Added nine schedule to protect the land reform and other laws included in it from the judicial review. Gave the status of a state to Nagaland and made special provisions for it. Empowered the parliament to control the production, supply and distribution of the foodstuffs, cattle fodder, raw cotton, cotton seed and raw jute in the public interest. Which of the changes were made in the first constitutional amendment act of 1951? The answer to this is 1 and 2 only. Why have we taken this practice question? Because this article on the Indian Express makes a reference to the first amendment to the constitution. We will try and understand which are the provisions that were added as part of the First Amendment. When we look into the First Amendment, the state was empowered to make special provisions for the advancement of socially and backward classes. The ninth schedule was added in the First Amendment Act of 1951. In the past, we have also had UPSC ask a similar question as well. When was the ninth schedule introduced? Was it during the Prime Ministership of Indira Gandhi ji or Jawaharlal Nehru ji? Such was the question which was also asked in the past as well. Three more grounds of restriction on Article 19 of 1, freedom of speech were added, public order, friendly relations with foreign state, incitement to an offence and finally, it also introduced the validity of state's move to nationalize any business or trade and the same to not be invalid on the grounds of violation of the right to trade and business. So remember, these were some of the provisions that were introduced as part of the first amendment. As part of the assignment, you have to put on the comment section in which amendment was this provision introduced. Gave the status of a state to Nagaland and made special provisions for it. Empowered the parliament to control the production, supply and distribution of foodstuffs. In which amendment was this introduced? Please put it on the comment section. Now let's look into the next practice question. Which of the following countries are part of the Gulf Cooperation Council? Bahrain, Iran, Kuwait, Oman, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Yemen. The answer to this is 1, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7 only. Why have we taken this practice question? Because this article on the Indian Express makes a reference to the Gulf Cooperation Council. Which are the countries which are part of the Gulf Cooperation Council? It includes Saudi Arabia, UAE, Qatar, Kuwait, Oman as well as Bahrain. Iran is not part of it and at the same time Yemen is not part of the Gulf Cooperation Council. It is only six countries which are part of the Gulf Cooperation Council. 
this article here is primarily focusing on the free trade agreement between India as well as the Gulf Cooperation Council. In the past, one of the Gulf Cooperation Council members happens to be United Arab Emirates. We have already entered into a free pact with the United Arab Emirates and now India is planning to enlarge this on a larger level where it will be entering a free trade agreement with these Gulf Cooperation Council countries. Why is it important? That is because from all these countries, India receives a lot of remittances as well. We also have a lot of Indian diaspora working in these areas. So if a free trade agreement is entered by India with all these countries, this will further enlarge the relationship. India imports predominantly crude oil and natural gas from the Gulf nations like Saudi Arabia and Qatar and exports pearls, precious and semi-precious stones, metals, imitation jewellery, electrical machinery, iron and steel, chemicals to these countries. India exports to GCC increased by 58.26% to about USD 44 billion in 2021 and 22 against 27.8 billion in 2020 and 21. So what we have seen is an increase when it comes to the trade relationship with all these countries. So it is also planning to enter free trade agreement with GCC. And when we speak about GCC, where is it headquartered? It is headquartered in Riyadh, which is in Saudi Arabia. Now let's look into the next practice question. With reference to the expenditure made by an organization or a company, which of the following statements is are correct? Acquiring new technology is capital expenditure. Debt financing is considered capital expenditure, while equity financing is considered revenue expenditure. Select the correct answer using the code given below. The answer to this is one only. This happens to be a previous year question from the year 2022. When we look into the first statement, yes, acquiring new technology is capital expenditure. When we speak about capital expenditure, it is the funds that are given to a particular company where they would be acquiring some physical assets. They would be acquiring, let's say, property or buildings or technology or equipment. So when they are acquiring something physical or which can be used as an asset, that is called as the capital expenditure. When you look into the second statement, debt financing is considered capital expenditure. This statement is wrong. When a company borrows money to be paid back in the near future, that is known as debt financing and repayment of loan is an example of capital expenditure. Now let's look into the fact of the day. The fact of the day for today's discussion is Sardar Vallabhai Patel. The government of India will observe Rashtriya Ekta Divas National Unity Day on 31st of October 2022. Why? To commemorate the 147th birth anniversary of Sardar Vallabhai Patel, the Iron Man of India. In this particular backdrop, we will try and understand some of the important contributions that Sardar Vallabhai Patel ji has contributed for India. Patel's father Jawar Bhai had been a soldier in the army of Rani Lakshmi Bhai of Chansi. His mother was Lad Bhai. He passed his matriculation back in the year 1897 and also pursued law in England. After completing his law course in 1913, Patel returned to India. He established his practice at Godra his well. He later moved his successful practice to Ahmedabad. Initially wanted to accumulate a lot of wealth and live a comfortable life. He had married. He also had two children as well. But over a period of time, his inclination shifted and his entire contributions was for the country. In Ahmedabad, he happened to meet Mahatma Gandhi and after a couple of meetings, came under his spell, he became an ardent follower of Gandhi and started involving in political work. He became the secretary of Gujarat wing of Congress party and volunteered to lead the Kheda campaign against taxation of the peasants since Gandhi himself would be a champaran. The Kheda campaign was a success and through a village by village tour, Patel and his associate compelled the peasants to refuse to pay the taxes until the government met their demands. After this, in 1920, he was elected the president of Gujarat Pradesh Congress Committee. He remained in that position till 1945 when Gandhi 
announced the non-cooperation movement in 1920. Patel supported him and worked tirelessly organizing it. Another major campaign led by Patel was Bartoli Satyagraha. It was during this period in 1928 he was also given the title called as Sardar that was bestowed on him by his colleagues. Patel was arrested during the Dandi Salt March of 1930. He supported the Quit India movement and inspired people to fight by an emotional speech made on 7th of August 1942. He was also arrested along with prominent national leaders and released only in June 1945. Patel represented India on the Partition Council where the division of public assets between the two nations were to be overseen so independent India and independent Pakistan assets were to be distributed. So he was one among the panel member in the Partition Council. Patel is revered in India not only for his role as a freedom fighter but also for his role in unifying the country after independence which is why he is considered as the Bismarck of India. Patel was in charge of the Provincial Constitution Committee, Advisory Committee on Fundamental Rights, Minorities and Tribal and Excluded Areas in the Constituent Assembly of India. For his role in setting up the modern civil services of India, he is also referred to as Patron Saint of Civil Services. If each of us are today preparing for the civil services and all of you are listening to this video, he was the one whom we should all thank. When many freedom fighters, including Jawaharlal Nehru, did not want to continue the legacy of civil services, it was Vallabhai Patel who stood for the civil services, who wanted to bring a transformation in the country and that is why the civil services is also called the steel frame of the country's garment missionary. It is only because of Vallabhai Patel ji that all of us have what is called as the civil services today in our country. Sardar Patel died in Bombay of a massive heart attack on 15 December 1950 at the age of 75. He was awarded Bharat Ratna posthumously in 1991. His birth anniversary is observed as Rashtriya Ekta Divas, National Unity Day since 2014. It is this that we have to understand with respect to Vallabhai Patel ji. That is it for today. Thank you for watching. All the best.